Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome everyone and good day. Uh, this is our last uh, class in our introduction to English uh, literature course at the Islamic University of Gaza. Uh, life in Gaza has been tough, generally, you know, with the siege, with the Israeli occupation, but we tried to uh, do something with literature so we can probably make sense out of life. Uh, try to empower ourselves, to raise our voices, to learn skills how to defend ourselves using non-violent creative uh, means. Hopefully, uh, like the uh, women writers, like the uh, outsiders of the likes of John Donne, Tristram Shandy, and Swift, and those people who resisted oppression, all sorts of oppression in their society, Hopefully you will be like them, you will learn from their techniques because as I usually say, uh, keep saying to you that literature is a means of, a tool of empowerment, a tool of, of criticism. Uh, as uh, Palestinians, as young people, English is not only our major, but it's our career and it can change our lives as uh, probably young people struggling in the, this difficult uh, uh, situation, and also as Palestinians uh, having to resist the oppression and injustices of the Israeli occupation. So literature, yeah, this is English literature, but remember always literature breaks all these barriers of time and place and ideology and, 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 and you know, geography. So uh, whether you're reading a Japanese story, a Mexican novel, Malaysian short story, a Russian um, uh, play, whatever, you will learn, you will benefit, it will empower you in a way, it will reach, touch your heart and mind in a way or, uh, or another. So hopefully uh, you will be able to uh, adopt some of these techniques, some of these, uh, learn some of the skills to enable you to, uh, to write. And that is one reason why I suggested some Palestinian uh, readings like uh, Hassan Kanafani's Men in the Sun and Gaza Writes Back, which is a collection of short stories by our students here at the English uh, department. So students like you who attended these courses, who took uh, these courses, who probably were sitting uh, somewhere uh, here. So probably their ghosts are with us now. So this course is not only about studying and memorizing and getting marks, although this is okay, Good, but it's about changing our lives to, to the better. Today I will do some, some review to help you wrap up certain things and uh, at the same time get, get you ready for the final exam. The final exam will contain three questions. Number one, there will be a choose the right answer question. And when you uh, choose the right answer, please uh, in, you know, you follow a strategy of your own, whatever strategy you like. But my advice is try to cover the answers, the choices given to you. So the question that says, uh, uh, this uh, blank sonnet uh, has a fixed rhyme scheme, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D. So is it Italian? Is it Shakespearean? Is it Dunyan? Is it uh, romantic? So before looking at the choices, try to say, OK, how many sonnets did I study? Like two major sonnets, but then we discussed probably John Donne, so three. Now, both Shakespeare and Donne have couplets. You know, what is the couplet? You know, it's, it doesn't have to be GG, but it, it's, you know, two rhyming lines of verse. Rhyming, same rhyme scheme. Look at the, the ending here, it says C, D, C, D, C, D. So it doesn't say C, C, or D, D, or E, E. So this is definitely not Shakespeare and definitely not, uh, uh, not, not uh, John Donne. So it's, it's, if you don't know, you just look at the choices given to you. If you still don't know, you need to minimize, like to eliminate one or two of the, I'll give you examples in, in a bit. Now, the second question will ask you to complete. And these questions are objective questions. You have to write just specific pieces of information or to take specific pieces of, of information. Now, the, because the fact that this is objective doesn't mean it's all 
uh, dependent on how much you memorize. You need to use this, answering uh, the questions. For example, uh, yeah, there will be, uh, we, uh, we will check your um, memorization of certain information. It's important, right? Uh, who wrote what, uh, the theme of a particular literary work, uh, uh, the major uh, literary work for a particular uh, author, a major feature of a particular uh, movement or, or school. But you need to depend on your understanding. And that means, for example, you go for the Romantic Age. Try to like, uh, write down the major features of the age, what it means to be Romantic poetry. Remember? Individualism, nature, simplicity, right? Imagination, sometimes memory. And then start to outline the major writers like Blake and Wordsworth and Coleridge and Keats and Byron and Shelley and try to, uh, uh, again, highlight the major features of every one of them and see where they agree and where they disagree. Okay, so for example, we spoke about Coleridge and Wordsworth. We said Coleridge is more into nature, a natural element of life. He's, you know, and even if you don't know, like you don't memorize these tiny little things, it's always good to think. I know some students who just a question they're not familiar with, they don't know, they just give up. Never leave an, a question unanswered. Please, don't do that. Uh, so try to think, to narrow down your, your answers. So if I tell you, uh, this is a romantic poet who uh, was mainly focusing on the mythical, irrational, supernatural element. Okay, so there's irrational, maybe I don't know this word. Or mythical, maybe I don't know this word. Uh, supernatural, we know the na nature, and then supernatural. Okay, so what do you want to do here? Just go back in time, try to revise in your mind. Okay, when we discussed Blake, Blake was Oros Dawatsek, what else? London, maybe, what else? Did we, uh, Tiger, Tiger, the lamb, so this is nature in a way. William Wordsworth, the daffodils, Lucy Gray, always. Uh, Coleridge, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, and the albatross, and how the albatross was killed, and then because the albatross was killed, the sea stops, the waves stop, the wind stops. Ah. Does this happen in real life? Is this natural? Is, is this normal? Or is this supernatural? The, so you can always guess. Yeah, there are natural elements, but this is mainly about the supernatural aspect. It's about the, imagine, the power of, of imagination. Okay? The questions are going to be direct. If there are uh, questions, like maybe there will be one, maximum two questions where you need to really think hard, but generally, more than 95% of the questions are straightforward. And finally, the uh, contextualization questions where you need to comment critically on a given extract. I'll show you examples and then give you the chance to ask questions. So, uh, remember this uh, extract? Uh, I can't remember where this is yours. Can you check the book and tell me? The cesura, was it after of and power? After a praise, okay. Control Z. What else? And then after after power, okay. So in the midterm exam, you had to comment critically or to contextualize some given extracts. In the final exam, you will have four extracts, four extracts, and you need to do three of them. Three of them, okay? And I'll tell you three, uh, contextualize three of the following. If you do four, I'll only grade the first three. Because I have like 250 students, we don't have much time to. Uh, so, what do you do with a text like this? Look at this. Number one, it's poetry. How can you tell? Generally, not always, poetry begins with a capital letter. If we have a hundred lines, every, even if it's not the beginning of a sentence, begins with a capital letter. 
That's the first thing I can see. And then the second thing, there is space in the middle. We see this all the time with Arabic poetry, but not English. We've seen Shakespeare, we've seen John Donne, we've seen all those. Uh, we don't have this physical gap in the middle of, of the uh, lines of, of poetry. So when did this happen? OK, you trigger your memory like, oh, that's old English. It happened in the past. Why did it happen? OK. Now, a, a student should always have you know, these mental maps where you map all the course. If you do them uh, physically at home studying for this course, that would be great. But do it also in your mind. Like, OK, old English, you create a circle, a spidergram, and then you start picking out things and branching out of this spidergram. So we spoke about the features of old English. We said it wasn't written. It was oral. And because it was oral, there were so, several things to make it easy to remember, to make it musical narrative. We said to spoke about the narrative aspect. We spoke about the musical aspect. So to make it easy, because people couldn't read and write, and you want it to be easy to remember, like all like Arabic poetry in the past was almost the same. Depended heavily on music, on certain themes, so that people could memorize. Like there were people who would memorize like 10,000 uh, uh, poems. OK? So OK, that's the first thing I also, the second thing I, I noticed. This is by only looking. This gap is called a caesura. It's, it comes from Caesar and Caesarian section. You know, when someone has a birth, you know, gives uh, birth to a baby by a Caesarian going on, undergoing a Caesarian section, that's because they cut uh, the belly. So a caesura is the gap in the middle of. Uh, in old, by the way, in old English, we have a physical gap. The caesura is still there. Sometimes we don't see it because they depend, they depend on the punctuation marks. OK. Uh, what, does it, what does it do here? It makes, what does the, the caesura do? Makes it musical. Now we must praise, but well, this is not the, old, the ancient old English. This is a modernized text. It makes, it makes it musical. It's musical. So it's easy to memorize and remember. Now we read the line and see what happens here. Now, now, not tomorrow, remember, every word counts. We, everyone, not me, not you, must, not should, not may, praise of heaven's kingdom. Heaven, king, heaven's kingdom. The keeper, ah, it's about God. And there is heaven, kingdom, the keeper of the Lord, the power and his wisdom. It's totally, purely religious poem, a religious text. Now, the rhyme scheme, look at this. The rhyme scheme, some of you in the midterm went for A, B, C, D. No, 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 no. That's not the rhyme scheme. That's not how you do the rhyme scheme. The rhyme, what is the rhyme scheme? How, you how do you define the rhyme scheme? It's the last sound, the, last the, the ending sound or sounds of a line of verse. The last sound or sounds at the end of a line of verse. Where's the end? Here. So keeper and wisdom. Just tell me A, B. Now, can I judge that this is regular or irregular? I can't. Why? We don't have the whole poem. Like with Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day, A? Thou art more lovely and more temperate, B. Can I say it's irregular? It can't. Unless you know the whole poem and see. So if it says A, B, A, B, regular. A, B, it could be A, B, C, C. Regular if we have regular uh, stanzas later on. So the, the other thing we notice, the religious language of this uh, extract. The language is religious. It means? It's about God. It's about praising God. And we notice something else. In the original text, there is an alliteration. The alliteration is the repetition of a particular sound or the beginning of some words in a line of verse. Could be in poetry and could be in, in praise. Like here, for example, K. 
kingdom and keeper. K -k -k yeah. Oh, yeah, could be a uh, keeper power. Praise keeper power could be something like this. Pa, pa, sound. So who's the author here? Remember we said all, all the English texts were anonymous except one. Yes. You have to have these plans yourself. Many of you said this is anonymous. It's not. It's Kedeman's hymn. Yeah. The author is not Kedeman's hymn. This is a hymn. You know, a hymn is a religious song. The author is Kedeman. Who's Kedeman? It is said that he was a shepherd who claimed to have heard the voice of God and the church people, the monks, knew his story, heard about him and said, hey, come join us. We can write the stories. Your poetry can be written down. Now, when you contextualize, it means you identify the author, the text, the context, and you comment on the features. You don't have to speak about things not in the text. One student was writing, with all due respect, of course, he almost wrote everything in the, uh, in, in the all features in Old English, like heroism, mythology, battles, uh, narrative. Good, but not here. When I bring you another text where you comment critically on a particular thing, a particular thing with narrative features or heroism, it's okay, it's up to you. We, we see that in, uh, what's his name? Uh, Beowulf. So, in brief, this extract, stanza, couplet, whatever you like, these lines are taken from Kedeman's hymn by Kedeman. This is an old English text. It's about praising God. The theme is the religion. It's a religious text. The language was always take something from the text and show me that you understand, you analyze the text. The repetition of several religious words like uh, heaven, kingdom, keeper shows. And the fact that it says we must, now we must also, now urgent, we collective everyone, you don't have a choice, must, you have no choice, shows how religion was powerful and strong at that time. The two main features we have, caesura. When you say the caesura is the gap, the physical gap between in the middle of the line of verse to create music, to make it easy to remember because people at that time could not read or write. Yes. Same thing with the alliteration. So this is another extract. By, by the look here, just look at it. I want to take off this thing. It's not poetry. Oh, yeah, it's not poetry. Look at it. Does it be Listen, now, modern poetry, free verse, could have this. But in the past, everything, I think everything we studied in our course uh, is either poetry or, or prose. Okay? You can't tell by looking at the base. So is this poetry? Look at I don't want you to do a rhyme scheme, organs A, same B, same B, by D. Or no, this is, this, is pro, this is a paragraph. It doesn't begin with a capital letter. OK? I am a Jew. So I'm not familiar with this. I did, you don't have to memorize the extract, I told you. But you should be able to recognize one when you see it. I am a Jew. Has not a Jew eyes. Aha, uh -huh, OK. We have had three texts with Jewish characters in the whole course. Fagin in Oliver Twist by Dickens. Barabbas in The Jew of Malta by Marlowe. And Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. Shakespeare and Marlowe are dramatists, plays, but remember, and remember plays were basically written in poetry, in verse. But not all roles, not everybody spoke poetry. Sometimes lowly characters, messengers, unimportant people, ignorant people, grave diggers, they would speak prose. Uh, people who sometimes Shakespeare who uh, doesn't want to like. So there's something. Some people say Shakespeare is anti-Semitic. One reason they would be giving say he gave uh, Shylock a prose role. Some people say, but Listen, he was not a native European. He's, this is not his first language, so Shakespeare was being realistic. Shakespeare 
is interesting because he always gives you several opinions. And that's the beauty of Shakespeare. Unlike Marlowe, sometimes Marlowe is very extreme in the Barabbas. So this is, this is Shylock from The Merchant of Venice by Shakespeare. This is a comedy or a tragedy or a tragic comedy or problem play. I said in the book it says this is basically a comedy, but that was in the past. When people started rereading the canon, they said, wait a minute. It's true that nobody dies, but look at Shylock, poor Shylock. He loses his money, he loses his daughter, he loses his uh, uh, dignity, his, uh, his re religion. He loses his chance to revenge, to, to prove that he's a human being. He deserves to be heard, to speak up, to resist. Poor Shylock. This is tragic for him. So tragic, tragic comedy, serious comedy, problem comedy, whatever you call it, for a reason. So here you want, the, f the theme here for Shakespeare is what? Shared humanity. He's saying, basically, I am like you. As he says, as a Christian is, I bleed like you. If you break us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. If a Jew wrong a Christian, it should be wrongs, right? But he doesn't speak perfect English. What is his humility, revenge? If a Christian wrong a Jew, what should his sufferance be by a, by a Christian example? Why? Revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will bitter the instruction. Powerful, powerful message here. So I'm like you, I have the right to resist, to fight back. That's why some of you agreed that uh, nowadays Shylock is closer to the Palestinians than to the Israelis because Shylock is a victim. Palestinians are being victimized by Israel. So even though Israel claims to be a Jewish state, they are the victimizers, they are the oppressors, they are the colonizers. Okay? So you speak about this, the shared humanity. And you need to pay attention to certain things. Like there is a clear, glaring irony in this. And I, you can't tell because you have to read the whole play, but I highlighted it. Earlier in the play, uh, Antonio was like, hey, Shiloh, let's uh, grab uh, something. Let's uh, grab a bite. Let's go have some pizza or cheesecake here or there. I know a place. And Shiloh was like, no, sorry. You eat pork. I'm a Jew. I don't eat your food. I don't drink your drinks. I don't. I'm not like you. I'm a Jew. And then later on he's saying, fed with the same, fed with the same food. Oh, wait a minute, Shylock. You just said, no, I don't eat your food. So that's ironic. Could be described as dramatic iron because of, uh, this is drama in a way where the audience uh, knows more than some other characters. OK, so this is Shylock from The Merchant of Venice. This is a play by Shakespeare, generally described as a comedy. But as a matter of fact, it's a serious uh, comedy because it's true the white Christian people live happily ever after. But the outsider, the Jewish character here, the person of color, suffers, pays a heavy price for being different, for racism. You need to speak about anti-Semitism and, and racism in this regard. Now, another example. I need to capitalize the I. And here you go. So how would you comment on this? Let's say this is in your final exam. Thank you very much, Hanin. That is, that is a first-person narrator. How do you know? Oh. I. What text? Who is the author? Who is the speaker? I married him. So there is marriage. So probably, listen, it's bad if you just say, because this is marriage, the author must be a woman. This is anti-feminist. OK, but again, yeah. 
when we studied the female novelists, we focused on particular themes, women being independent and strong and powerful and resisting and fighting and trying to be different, trying to uh, make their dreams come true. So, so probably the author is a woman. How many women authors did we study? Not many. Reader. Jane Austen? Nope. I used to think that this is from Jane Austen, uh, Sense and Sensibility, but it's not. This is? You need to revise. Mary Manley is a poet? Not a poet, yeah? But did we, did we take extracts? Mary, Mary Manley is a poet. She wrote poetry. We studied poetry from Mary Manley. Well done. No, Mary Manley is a Novelist? A critic. She was a Was she? So who said this? What is the text? What is the... OK. So you need, again, go home. When you study this course, you, you still have plenty of time. Try to do drawings and shapes and graphs and spider crumbs. So we spoke about the Bronte sisters, Charlotte, Emily, and in passing, we mentioned Anne. Now, Charlotte Bronte, in her, in her novel, Jane Eyre, she speaks about this unique relationship between a poor woman, Jane, and Rochester, the rich old man who was already married. So this is from Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Because we have three Brontes, you need to say Charlotte Bronte. Saying Bronte alone is not enough. Like saying Shelley. We have Mary Shelley, and we have the husband, uh, uh, Percy Shelley. So again, what, what would you comment on? Number one, that this is a, a first-person narrator. What else? Thank you. We don't have this often. But nowadays, we usually don't have this. But in that time, especially women wanted to create new techniques and devices to reach out to engage the readers, to make the reader feel that, oh my god, she's making me special. She's talking to me directly. So reader, I married him. This is. The tone is what? Victorious, right? Hopeful, like? Finally. Yeah, finally. I, I did it. So, who married whom? Jane. The speaker is the girl or the boy? The man or the woman? The woman. The woman. So, the woman being the speaker is also uh, a feature of female writing. And here, for the first time, remember what we saw in Richardson and Fielding, where women always get raped, get killed, they die. They just fail miserably because, men, because of men, male violence. But for female writers, they always showed the positive aspect outcome of a struggle. You struggle, you fight, you resist, you will win. You will end up independent, victorious. You'll, your dreams will come true. So. How are you going to comment on this? You're going to say that this is Jane Eyre, a novel by Charlotte Bronte. The novel is about a relationship between a man and a woman, a, a poor wo young woman and an old rich man who is originally married to another woman. You don't have to tell me the story in detail. Just focus on this. In this extract, uh, Jane. Jane is directly talking to us as readers, declaring her victory, declaring that she achieved her uh, objective. She is no longer, the woman is independent and powerful. She is no longer a tool, an object where the man is chasing her. Another example. OK, wait, just wait a minute, a little bit. Facts teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. And teacher. Yeah, there is a teacher here. So generally, generally, this is an extract taken from, I don't know, maybe. But let's narrow down. 
This is about school and learning and education. So the theme is teaching, school, education system. And the speaker is saying facts. Teach these boys and girls nothing but facts. Ah, so he doesn't want imagination, fancy, creativity. He just wants facts. Facts are nothing. So yeah, you can narrow it to the Victorian age where the, where the novel became a social uh, tool of criticism. When we spoke about women writers, we said that they were fo mainly focusing on female issues and themes and female struggle. But the male writers were focusing on these themes. This is how you think, how you narrow down. So we have studied only two figures, uh, novelists in the Victorian age, Dickens and Thomas Hardy, Charles Dickens and Thomas Hardy. You know, Hardy was bleak and dark, pessimistic, with all the horrible, unhappy endings, with people dying like Shakespeare, but in prose. And Dickens was more of a social critic, philosophical, social critic, political critic also. So this is, this is Dickens' novel, Hard Times. A speaker is, Mr. Gradgrind. Even if you forget the name, it's fine as long as you get the context. So the speak, if you say the speaker here is talking to a teacher where he is directing him how to deal with the kids, with the students in the class. He wants no imagination. He wants no creativity, no fancy, nothing. He wants only facts. Dickens here is clearly criticizing the society and its failing education system, where kids are not trained to be creative, imaginative, and fanciful, but are just exposed to facts, and the ending is not going to be good for them. In hard times, we spoke about two themes, criticizing the, the education system and criticizing the working conditions of the uh, laborers, the industrial revolution, and its impact. Hard Times, Charles Dickens, Mr. Gradgrind, social criticism, criticizing the education system. Look, at, for example, if you want to say something about the text, how he's very assertive, very emphatic, by repeating the word facts, and by, say, using this negative structure, not but, nothing but. I want nothing but pizza. Like you're not, you're emphatic here. Okay, I'll give you something from a previous exam. Very quickly, we'll go through these and then we stop there. So, when you study for the course, try to usually highlight two important things about each writer and about each text. Uh, that now, the first sentence, for example, let's see how you narrow down. The first question says, a tragedy by Shakespeare. So it's a tragedy, not a comedy. So you, comedy, excuse me, come here. It's history, come here. Roman, by Shakespeare that deals with the father children. OK, father children. No father children in Macbeth. No father children in Othello. This is how you narrow down. A relationship theme, it is considered to be the most pessimistic, where there's no hope, dark, of his tragedies. King Lear. A group of poets who lived in the 17th century, they were named so by Dr. Johnson, and they later were admired by T.S. Eliot. Metaphysical poets, 17th century, so not the Romantics, not the Victorian. The Battle of Malden is a long medieval poem about battles and heroes, but it is much more factual than the main heroic text of the time, which is Bewolf. And that's the trick here. The question is not about Bewolf. It's there to compare it with the other text, Bewolf. Sweet Thames, run swiftly till I end my song is a law line from Prothalamian that is written by Edmund Spencer, the Prince of Poets. 
And finally, I mean, like, notice here sometimes you are asked about the text, the theme, the topic, the poet, the writer, a theme. Look at this as a, a question number five, focusing on uh, uh, the literary device used. A medieval poet whose satire in Piers Plowman is considered bitter. Wait, wait a minute here. Now, the question says a medieval poet and gives you the blank to, co to, co to co uh, continue, to complete. The name of the text is given to you, with, to you. You should be able to identify that this is medieval text. And the word satire is given to you also, where he uses satire, bitter satire, and, and irony sometimes. So all you need to do here is identify the, the author. The author is William Langlam. The whole question could be reworded in other words, where you need to, uh, a medieval poet, or for example, William Langland is a medieval poet whose, oh, he uses as a literary device to bitterly criticize his life and his society. Satire. Satire. As a literary device. The dream vision is not a literary device, basically more or less. So these are examples. You look, go through the text and revise again. This is from the first half of the course. And I'm sure you will be, you will, you will be fine. Start today, plan your revision, and I wish you all the best. If you have questions, please ask. If, you, if we don't have time now, we can ask uh, questions online. OK, good luck. Thank you. It's been uh, my pleasure to teach you this course. And I wish you all the luck in the world. I'll take